Belinda Audio presents this recording of The 80-20 Principle, The Secret of Achieving More with Less, Second Edition, written by Richard Koch and read by Richard Aspel. Praise for the 80-20 Principle. Congratulations, the 80-20 Principle is terrific. Al Rees, best-selling author of Focus and Positioning. There are ideas in here that could change your life. The Good Book Guide. Kosh is a passionate 80 20 -er. Read this and you will be too. Andrew Campbell, Ashridge Strategic Management Centre. Both astute and entertaining, this is an intriguing book to help people concentrate on not wasting their lives. Professor Theodore Zeldin, St. Anthony's College, Oxford. We give this Dali-esque masterwork five stars, a beautiful collage of well-written prose. The book is worth many times its price. The Western Review, Tampa Bay, Florida. The 80-20 Principle For a very long time, the Pareto Law, the 80-20 Principle, has lumbered the economic scene like an erratic block on the landscape, an empirical law which nobody can explain. Joseph Steindl God plays dice with the universe, but they're loaded dice, and the main objective is to find out by what rules they were loaded and how we can use them for our own ends. Joseph Ford. We cannot be certain to what height the human species may aspire. We may therefore safely acquiesce in the pleasing conclusion that every age of the world has increased and still increases the real wealth, the happiness, the knowledge and perhaps the virtue of the human race. Edward Gibbon. Preface to the second edition. I wrote this book in South Africa in 1996 and came to London in the so-called summer of 1997 to launch it. I remember traipsing from radio station to television station, usually to find that my slot had been pulled at the last minute. When I did get on the air, nobody seemed very interested in the findings of an obscure Italian economist in the dying years of the 19th century. Ooh, one celebrity of the minute crooned on a talk show. What are you doing here if you didn't come up with this idea yourself? I would like to say that without missing a beat, I mentioned the influence of St Paul and the Gospel writers in doing the heavy lifting for the ideas of one Jesus of Nazareth, who would otherwise have been unknown. I would like to say that, but in fact I was lost for words. I returned to Cape Town thoroughly dejected. And then, a minor miracle. The British publisher who had commissioned the work, a man well known for looking on the gloomy side, faxed me, remember faxes? To say that despite the PR fiasco, the book was selling very well. In fact, the book has sold more than 700,000 copies worldwide and been translated into 24 languages. More than a century since Vilfredo Pareto noted the consistently lopsided relationship between inputs and outputs, and a decade since this book reinterpreted Pareto's principle, I think we can now say that the principle has stood the test of time. There has been massive feedback, mainly positive, from readers and reviewers. Throughout the world, a large number of individuals, perhaps hundreds of thousands, have found the principle useful at work and in their careers, and increasingly in the whole of their lives. The 80-20 principle has two almost opposite appeals. On the one hand, it is a statistical observation, a proven pattern, solid, quantitative, reliable, hard. It pleases those who want to get more out of life, to get ahead of the crowd, to increase profits or decrease effort or costs in the pursuit of gain, 
to dramatically raise efficiency defined as output divided by input. If we can spot the few cases where the results relative to effort are so much greater than usual, we can become so much more efficient in whatever task we want to accomplish. The principle allows us to enhance our achievement while escaping the tyranny of overwork. On the other hand, the principle has a totally different side. Soft, mystical, eerie, almost magic in the way that the same pattern of numbers crops up everywhere and related not to efficiency at all, but to everything that makes our lives worthwhile. The sense that we are connected to each other and to the universe by a mysterious law, which we can tap into and which can change our lives, generates a sense of wonder and awe. Looking back, I think what was different about my book was that it extended the domain of the principle. It had previously been well known in the business arena to increase efficiency. As far as I know, it had never previously been deployed to enhance the quality and depth of our whole lives. It's only in retrospect that I have fully realised the dual nature of the principle, the curious but perfect tension between its two sides, hard efficiency and soft life enhancement. As I explore in the new chapter of the book, this tension represents the yin and yang of the principle, the dialectic where efficiency and life-enhancing uses of it are complementary opposites. Efficiency clears the space for life enhancement, while life enhancement requires us to be clear about the few things that are really important in our work, relationships and all the other activities we do in our lives. Of course, not everyone accepted my reinterpretation of Pareto's principle. I was surprised at how controversial the book became. While it had its fierce supporters, and a huge number of quiet people who wrote to me saying the book had changed both their professional life and their life as a whole, there were many people who disliked the extension of the principle to the softer side of life, and said so with great clarity and eloquence. The opposition took me aback, but then I came to welcome the contrary voices. They have made me think about the principle more deeply, and, as I hope is demonstrated in the final chapter, reach a greater understanding of its dual nature. What is new about this edition? To start with, less is more. I have cut out the original final chapter, Progress Regained. This was a frankly unsuccessful attempt to apply the 80-20 principle to society and politics. Whereas every other part of the book generated both positive and negative comments, this chapter seems to have fallen entirely on stony ground. The only piece I have retained is the conclusion, which is an appeal to individuals to take action. I have replaced it with an entirely new chapter, the yin and yang of the principle. This covers the highlights generated by a decade of reviews, conversations, letters and emails, and amplifies and categorises the best criticisms of the principle, before giving my response. I believe this takes us to a new level of awareness and understanding of the power of the principle. It remains for me to thank everyone who has contributed to the great 8020 debate. Long may it continue, and thank you all so much. I may have touched your lives, but you have certainly touched mine, and I am most grateful. Richard Koch. Richard Koch at btinternet.com. Estepona, Spain, February 2007. The 8020 Rap. Did you know that there is an excellent 8020 rap song, courtesy of the incomparable Wyatt Moe G. Jackson? You can listen to it on the web if you like at www.the8020principle.com. It lasts three minutes, like a pop song should. Here are the lyrics, which are interspersed with me summing up the message of this book. Richard Koch is a businessman. He discovered a truth, yes, a master plan. Write a book about it, became a hit. It's not only cool, it's also legit. 
The 80-20 principle is the title. The lessons it teaches you are vital. Sit back and listen to this sound bite. By the time that you're finished, you'll see the light. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more with less. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more. So what is the 80-20 principle? The 80-20 principle asserts that a minority, a small number of causes, inputs or effort, usually leads to a majority of the results, outputs or rewards. So most of the outputs result from a very small part of the causes or inputs. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more with less. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more. Taken literally, this means that, for example, 80% of what we achieve in our job comes from 20% of the time we spend. Thus, for all practical purposes, four-fifths of our effort, pretty much all of it really, is largely irrelevant. And this is contrary, of course, to what we normally expect. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more with less. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more. So the 80-20 principle states that there is an inbuilt imbalance between causes and results, inputs and outputs, efforts and rewards. A good benchmark for this imbalance is provided by the 80-20 relationship. A typical pattern will show that 80% of outputs result from 20% of inputs. 80% of consequences flow from 20% of causes. Or, 80% of results come from 20% of effort. In business, many examples of the 80-20 principle have been validated. 20% of products usually account for about 80% of dollar sales. So do 20% of customers. And 20% of products or customers also usually account for 80% of an organization's profits. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more with less. The 80-20 principle, the key to success. The 80-20 principle, achieve more. Part 1. Overture. The universe is wonky. What is the 80-20 principle? The 80-20 principle tells us that in any population, some things are likely to be much more important than others. A good benchmark or hypothesis is that 80% of results or outputs flow from 20% of causes and sometimes from a much smaller proportion of powerful forces. Everyday language is a good illustration. Sir Isaac Pittman, who invented shorthand, discovered that just 700 common words make up two-thirds of our conversation. Including the derivatives of these words, Pittman found that these words account for 80% of common speech. In this case, fewer than 1% of words, the new shorter Oxford English Dictionary lists over half a million words, are used 80% of the time. We could call this an 81 principle. Similarly, over 99% of talk uses fewer than 20% of words. We could call this a 99-20 relationship. The movies illustrate the 80-20 principle. A recent study shows that 1.3% of movies earn 80% of box office revenues, producing virtually an 81 rule. The 80-20 principle is not a magic formula. Sometimes the relationship between results and causes is closer to 70-30 than to 80-20 or 81. But it is very rarely true that 50% of causes lead to 50% of results. The universe is predictably unbalanced. Few things really matter. Truly effective people and organisations batten on to the few powerful forces at work in their worlds and turn them to their advantage. Keep listening to find out how you can do the same. Chapter 1 Welcome to the 80-20 Principle. 
For a very long time, the Pareto law, the 80-20 principle, has lumbered the economic scene like an erratic block on the landscape, an empirical law which nobody can explain. Joseph Steindl. The 80-20 principle can and should be used by every intelligent person in their daily life, by every organisation and by every social grouping and form of society. It can help individuals and groups achieve much more with much less effort. The 80-20 principle can raise personal effectiveness and happiness. It can multiply the profitability of corporations and the effectiveness of any organisation. It even holds the key to raising the quality and quantity of public services while cutting their cost. This book, the first ever on the 80-20 principle, is written from a burning conviction validated in personal and business experience that this principle is one of the best ways of dealing with and transcending the pressures of modern life. What is the 80-20 principle? The 80-20 principle asserts that a minority of causes, inputs or effort, usually lead to a majority of the results, outputs or rewards. Taken literally, this means that, for example, 80% of what you achieve in your job comes from 20% of the time spent. Thus, for all practical purposes, four-fifths of the effort, a dominant part of it, is largely irrelevant. This is contrary to what people normally expect. So, the 80-20 principle states that there is an inbuilt imbalance between causes and results, inputs and outputs, and effort and reward. A good benchmark for this imbalance is provided by the 80-20 relationship. A typical pattern will show that 80% of outputs result from 20% of inputs, that 80% of consequences flow from 20% of causes, or that 80% of results come from 20% of effort. In business, many examples of the 80-20 principle have been validated. 20% of products usually account for about 80% of dollar sales value. So do 20% of customers. 20% of products or customers usually also account for about 80% of an organisation's profits. In society, 20% of criminals account for 80% of the value of all crime. 20% of motorists cause 80% of accidents. 20% of those who marry comprise 80% of the divorce statistics. Those who consistently remarry and re-divorce distort the statistics and give a lopsidedly pessimistic impression of the extent of marital fidelity. 20% of children attain 80% of educational qualifications available. In the home, 20% of your carpets are likely to get 80% of the wear. 20% of your clothes will be worn 80% of the time. And if you have an intruder alarm, 80% of the false alarms will be set off by 20% of the possible causes. The internal combustion engine is a great tribute to the 80-20 principle. 80% of the energy is wasted in combustion and only 20% gets to the wheels. This 20% of the input generates 100% of the output. Pareto's discovery. Systematic and predictable lack of balance. The pattern underlying the 80-20 principle was discovered in 1897, exactly 100 years ago, by Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, 1848-1923. His discovery has since been called many names, including the Pareto Principle, the Pareto Law, the 80-20 Rule, the Principle of Least Effort, and the Principle of Imbalance. Throughout this book, we will call it the 80-20 Principle. By a subterranean process of influence on many important achievers, especially business people, computer enthusiasts, and quality engineers, the 80-20 principle has helped to shape the modern world. Yet it has remained one of the great secrets of our time. And even the select band of cognoscenti who know and use the 80-20 principle only exploit a tiny proportion of its power. So what did Vilfredo Pareto discover? He happened to be looking at patterns of wealth and income in 19th century England. 
he found that most income and wealth went to a minority of the people in his samples. Perhaps there was nothing very surprising in this, but he also discovered two other facts that he thought highly significant. One was that there was a consistent mathematical relationship between the proportion of people, as a percentage of the total relevant population, and the amount of income or wealth that this group enjoyed. To simplify, if 20% of the population enjoyed 80% of the wealth, then you could reliably predict that 10% would have, say, 65% of the wealth, and 5% would have 50%. The key point is not the percentages, but the fact that the distribution of wealth across the population was predictably unbalanced. Pareto's other finding, one that really excited him, was that this pattern of imbalance was repeated consistently whenever he looked at data referring to different time periods or different countries. Whether he looked at England in earlier times or whatever data were available from other countries in his own time or earlier, he found the same pattern repeating itself over and over again with mathematical precision. Was this a freak coincidence or something that had great importance for economics and society? Would it work if applied to sets of data relating to things other than wealth or income? Pareto was a terrific innovator because before him no one had looked at two related sets of data. In this case, the distribution of incomes or wealth compared to the number of income earners or property owners and compared percentages between the two sets of data. Nowadays, this method is commonplace and has led to major breakthroughs in business and economics. Sadly, although Pareto realised the importance and wide range of his discovery, he was very bad at explaining it. He moved on to a series of fascinating but rambling sociological theories, centering on the role of elites, which were hijacked at the end of his life by Mussolini's fascists. The significance of the 80-20 principle lay dormant for a generation. While a few economists, especially in the US, realised its importance, it was not until after the Second World War that two parallel yet completely different pioneers began to make waves with the 80-20 principle. 1949. Zipf's Principle of Least Effort. One of these pioneers was the Harvard professor of philology, George K. Zipf. In 1949, Zipf discovered the principle of least effort, which was actually a rediscovery and elaboration of Pareto's principle. Zipf's principle said that resources, people, goods, time, skills, or anything else that is productive, tended to arrange themselves so as to minimise work, so that approximately... 20 to 30 percent of any resource accounted for 70 to 80 percent of the activity related to that resource. Professor Zipf used population statistics, books, philology and industrial behaviour to show the consistent recurrence of this unbalanced pattern. For example, he analysed all the Philadelphia marriage licences granted in 1931 in a 20-block area, demonstrating that 70% of the marriages occurred between people who lived within 30% of the distance. Incidentally, Zipf also provided a scientific justification for the messy desk by justifying clutter with another law. Frequency of use draws near to us things that are frequently used. Intelligent secretaries have long known that files in frequent use should not be filed. 1951. Duran's rule of the vital few and the rise of Japan. The other pioneer of the 80-20 principle was the great quality guru, Romanian-born US engineer Joseph Moses Duran, born 1904, the man behind the quality revolution of 1950-90. to he made what he alternately called the Pareto Principle and the Rule of the Vital Few virtually synonymous with the search for high product quality. In 1924, Duran joined Western Electric, the manufacturing division of Bell Telephone System, starting as a corporate industrial engineer 
and later setting up as one of the world's first quality consultants. His great idea was to use the 80-20 principle, together with other statistical methods, to root out quality faults and improve the reliability and value of industrial and consumer goods. Durand's path-breaking Quality Control Handbook was first published in 1951 and extolled the 80-20 principle in very broad terms. The economist Pareto found that wealth was non-uniformly distributed in the same way as Durand's observations about quality losses. Many other instances can be found the distribution of crime amongst criminals, the distribution of accidents among hazardous processes, etc. Pareto's principle of unequal distribution applied to distribution of wealth and to distribution of quality losses. No major US industrialist was interested in Duran's theories. In 1953, he was invited to Japan to lecture and met a receptive audience. He stayed on to work with several Japanese corporations, transforming the value and quality of their consumer goods. It was only once the Japanese threat to US industry had become apparent, after 1970, that Duran was taken seriously in the West. He moved back to do for US industry what he had done for the Japanese. The 80-20 principle was at the heart of this global quality revolution. From the 1960s to the 1990s, progress from using the 80-20 principle. IBM was one of the earliest and most successful corporations to spot and use the 80-20 principle, which helps to explain why most computer systems specialists trained in the 1960s and 1970s are familiar with the idea. In 1963, IBM discovered that about 80% of a computer's time is spent executing about 20% of the operating code. The company immediately rewrote its operating software to make the most used 20% very accessible and user-friendly, thus making IBM computers more efficient and faster than competitors' machines for the majority of applications. Those who developed the personal computer and its software in the next generation, such as Apple, Lotus and Microsoft, applied the 80-20 principle with even more gusto to make their machines cheaper and easier to use for a new tranche of customers, including the now celebrated dummies who would previously have given computers a very wide berth. Winner take all. A century after Pareto, the implications of the 80-20 principle has surfaced in a recent controversy over the astronomic and ever-rising incomes going to superstars and those very few people at the top of a growing number of professions. Film director Steven Spielberg earned $165 million in 1994. Joseph Jamile, the most highly paid trial lawyer, was paid $90 million. Merely competent film directors or lawyers, of course, earn a tiny fraction of these sums. The 20th century has seen massive efforts to level incomes, but inequality, removed in one sphere, keeps popping up in another. In the USA from 1973 to 1995, average real incomes rose by 36%, yet the comparable figure for non-supervisory workers fell by 14%. During the 1980s, all of the gains went to the top 20% of earners and a mind-boggling 64% of the total increase went to the top 1%. The ownership of shares in the US is also heavily concentrated within a small minority of households. 5% of US households own about 75% of the household sector's equity. A similar effect may be seen in the role of the dollar, Almost 50% of world trade is invoiced in dollars, far above America's 13% share of world exports. And while the dollar's share of foreign exchange reserves is 64%, the ratio of American GDP to global output is just over 20%. The 80-20 principle will always reassert itself unless conscious, consistent and massive efforts are made and sustained to overcome it why the 80-20 principle is so important. 
The reason that the 80-20 principle is so valuable is that it is counterintuitive. We tend to expect that all causes will have roughly the same significance, that all customers are equally valuable, that every bit of business, every product and every dollar of sales revenue is as good as any other, that all employees in a particular category have roughly equivalent value, that each day or week or year we spend has the same significance, that all our friends have roughly equal value to us, that all inquiries or phone calls should be treated in the same way, that one university is as good as another, that all problems have a large number of causes so that it is not worth isolating a few key causes, that all opportunities are of roughly equal value so that we treat them all equally. We tend to assume that 50% of causes or inputs will account for 50% of results or outputs. There seems to be a natural, almost democratic, expectation that causes and results are generally equally balanced. And, of course, sometimes they are. But this 50-50 fallacy is one of the most inaccurate and harmful, as well as the most deeply rooted, of our mental maps. The 80-20 principle asserts that when two sets of data relating to causes and results can be examined and analysed, the most likely result is that there will be a pattern of imbalance. The imbalance may be 65-35, 70-30, 75-25, 80-20, 95-5, or 99.9, 0.1, or any set of numbers in between. However, the two numbers in the comparison don't have to add up to 100. The 80-20 principle also asserts that when we know the true relationship, we are likely to be surprised at how unbalanced it is. Whatever the actual level of imbalance, it is likely to exceed our prior estimate. Executives may suspect that some customers and some products are more profitable than others, but when the extent of the difference is proved, they are likely to be surprised and sometimes dumbfounded. Teachers may know that the majority of their disciplinary troubles or most truancy arises from a minority of pupils, but if records are analysed, the extent of the imbalance will probably be larger than expected. We may feel that some of our time is more valuable than the rest, but if we measure inputs and outputs, the disparity can still stun us. Why should you care about the 80-20 principle? Whether you realise it or not, the principle applies to your life, to your social world and to the place where you work. Understanding the 80-20 principle gives you great insight into what is really happening in the world around you. The overriding message of this book is that our daily lives can be greatly improved by using the 80-20 principle. Each individual can be more effective and happier. Each profit-seeking corporation can become very much more profitable. Each non-profit organisation can also deliver much more useful outputs. Every government can ensure that its citizens benefit much more from its existence. For everyone and every institution, it is possible to obtain much more that is of value and avoid what has negative value with much less input of effort, expense or investment. At the heart of this progress is a process of substitution. Resources that have weak effects in any particular use are not used or are used sparingly. Resources that have powerful effects are used as much as possible. Every resource is ideally used where it has the greatest value. Wherever possible, weak resources are developed so that they can mimic the behaviour of the stronger resources. Business and markets have used this process to great effect for hundreds of years. The French economist J.B. Say coined the word entrepreneur around 1800, saying that the entrepreneur shifts economic resources out of an area of lower productivity into an area of higher productivity and yield. But one fascinating implication of the 80-20 principle is how far businesses and markets still are from producing optimal solutions. 
For example, the 80-20 principle asserts that 20% of products or customers or employees are really responsible for about 80% of profits. If this is true, and detailed investigations usually confirm that some such very unbalanced pattern exists, the state of affairs implied is very far from being efficient or optimal. The implication is that 80% of products or customers or employees are only contributing 20% of profits, that there is great waste, that the most powerful resources of the company are being held back by a majority of much less effective resources, and that profits could be multiplied if more of the best sort of products could be sold, employees hired or customers attracted, or convinced to buy more from the firm. In this kind of situation, one might well ask, why continue to make the 80% of products that only generate 20% of profits? Companies rarely ask these questions, perhaps because to answer them would mean very radical action. To stop doing four-fifths of what you are doing is not a trivial change. What J.B. Say called the work of entrepreneurs, modern financiers call arbitrage. International financial markets are very quick to correct anomalies in valuation, for example, between exchange rates. But business organisations and individuals are generally very poor at this sort of entrepreneurship or arbitrage, at shifting resources from where they have weak results to where they have powerful results, or at cutting off low-value resources and buying more high-value resources. Most of the time, we do not realise the extent to which some resources, but only a small minority, are superproductive. What Joseph Duran called the vital few, while the majority, the trivial many, exhibit little productivity or else actually have negative value. If we did realise the difference between the vital few and the trivial many in all aspects of our lives, and if we did something about it, we could multiply anything that we valued. The 80-20 principle and chaos theory. Probability theory tells us that it is virtually impossible for all the applications of the 80-20 principle to occur randomly, as a freak of chance. We can only explain the principle by positing some deeper meaning or cause that lurks behind it. Pareto himself grappled with this issue, trying to apply a consistent methodology to the study of society. He searched for theories that picture facts of experience and observation, for regular patterns, social laws or uniformities that explain the behaviour of individuals and society. Pareto's sociology failed to find a persuasive key. He died long before the emergence of chaos theory, which has great parallels with the 80-20 principle and helps to explain it. The last third of the 20th century saw a revolution in the way that scientists think about the universe, overturning the prevailing wisdom for the past 350 years. That prevailing wisdom was a machine-based and rational view, which itself was a great advance on the mystical and random view of the world which was held in the Middle Ages. The machine-based view converted God from being an irrational and unpredictable force into a more user-friendly clockmaker engineer. The view of the world held from the 17th century, and still prevalent today, except in advanced scientific circles, was immensely comforting and useful. All phenomena were reduced to regular, predictable, linear relationships. For example, A causes B, B causes C, and A plus C cause D. This worldview enabled any individual part of the universe, the operation of the human heart, for example, or of any individual market, to be analysed separately, because the whole was the sum of the parts, and vice versa. But in the 21st century, it seems much more accurate to view the world as an evolving organism, where the whole system is more than the sum of its parts, and where relationships between the parts are non-linear. Causes are difficult to pin down. There are complex interdependencies between causes, and causes and effects are blurred. The snag with linear thinking is that it doesn't always work. It is an oversimplification of reality. Equilibrium is illusory or fleeting. 
the universe is wonky. Yet chaos theory, despite its name, does not say that everything is a hopeless and incomprehensible mess. Rather, there is a self-organising logic lurking behind the disorder, a predictable non-linearity, something which economist Paul Krugman has called spooky, eerie and terrifyingly exact. The logic is more difficult to describe than to detect and is not totally dissimilar to the recurrence of a theme in a piece of music. Certain characteristic patterns recur, but with infinite and unpredictable variety. Chaos theory and the 80-20 principle illuminate each other. What have chaos theory and related scientific concepts got to do with the 80-20 principle? Although no one else appears to have made the link, I think the answer is a great deal. The principle of imbalance. The common thread between chaos theory and the 80-20 principle is the issue of balance, or more precisely, imbalance. Both chaos theory and the 80-20 principle assert, with a great deal of empirical backing, that the universe is unbalanced. They both say that the world is not linear, cause and effect are rarely linked in an equal way. Both also place great store by self-organisation. Some forces are always more forceful than others and will try to grab more than their fair share of resources. Chaos theory helps to explain why and how this imbalance happens by tracing a number of developments over time. The universe is not a straight line. The 80-20 principle, like chaos theory, is based around the idea of non-linearity. A great deal of what happens is unimportant and can be disregarded. Yet there are always a few forces that have an influence way beyond their numbers. These are the forces that must be identified and watched. If they are forces for good, we should multiply them. If they are forces we don't like, we need to think very carefully about how to neutralise them. The 80-20 principle supplies a very powerful empirical test of non-linearity in any system. We can ask, do 20% of causes lead to 80% of results? Is 80% of any phenomenon associated with only 20% of a related phenomenon? This is a useful method to flush out non-linearity, but it is even more useful because it directs us to identifying the unusually powerful forces at work. Feedback loops distort and disturb balance. The 80-20 principle is also consistent with, and can be explained by reference to, the feedback loops identified by chaos theory, whereby small initial influences can become greatly multiplied and produce highly unexpected results, which nevertheless can be explained in retrospect. In the absence of feedback loops, the natural distribution of phenomena would be 50-50. Inputs of a given frequency would lead to commensurate results. It is only because of positive and negative feedback loops that causes do not have equal results. Yet, it also seems to be true that powerful positive feedback loops only affect a small minority of the inputs. This helps to explain why those small minority of inputs can exert so much influence we can see positive feedback loops operating in many areas, explaining how it is that we typically end up with 80-20 rather than 50-50 relationships between populations. For example, the rich get richer, not just or mainly because of superior abilities, but because riches beget riches. A similar phenomenon exists with goldfish in a pond, even if you start with goldfish almost exactly the same size, those that are slightly bigger become very much bigger because even with only slight initial advantages in stronger propulsion and larger mouths, they are able to capture and gobble up disproportionate amounts of food. The tipping point. Related to the idea of feedback loops is the concept of the tipping point. Up to a certain point, a new force, whether it is a new product, a disease, a new rock group or even a new social habit such as jogging or rollerblading, finds it difficult to make headway. 
a great deal of effort generates little by way of results. At this point, many pioneers give up. But if the new force persists and can cross a certain invisible line, a small amount of additional effort can reap huge returns. This invisible line is the tipping point. The concept comes from the principles of epidemic theory. The tipping point is the point at which an ordinary and stable phenomenon, a low-level flu outbreak, can turn into a public health crisis because of the number of people who are infected and can therefore infect others. And since the behaviour of epidemics is non-linear and they don't behave in the way we expect, small changes, like bringing new infections down to 30,000 from 40,000, can have huge effects. It all depends when and how the changes are made. First come, best served. Chaos theory advocates sensitive dependence on initial conditions. What happens first, even something ostensibly trivial, can have a disproportionate effect. This resonates with, and helps to explain, the 80-20 principle. The latter states that a minority of causes exert a majority of effects. One limitation of the 80-20 principle, taken in isolation, is that it always represents a snapshot of what is true now, or, more precisely, in the very recent past when the snapshot was taken. This is where chaos theory's doctrine of sensitive dependence on initial conditions is helpful. A small lead early on can turn into a larger lead or a dominant position later on, until equilibrium is disturbed and another small force then exerts a disproportionate influence. A firm that in the early stages of a market, provides a product that is 10% better than its rivals, may end up with 100 or 200% greater market share, even if the rivals later provide a better product. In the early days of motoring, if 51% of drivers or countries decide to drive on the right rather than the left of the road, this will tend to become the norm for nearly 100% of road users. In the early days of using a circular clock, if 51% of clocks go what we now call clockwise rather than counterclockwise, this convention will become dominant, although clocks could just as logically have moved to the left. In fact, the clock over Florence Cathedral moves counterclockwise and shows 24 hours. Soon after 1442, when the cathedral was built, the authorities and clockmakers standardised on a 12-hour clockwise clock, because the majority of clocks had those features. Yet, if 51% of clocks had ever been like the clock over Florence Cathedral, we would now be reading a 24-hour clock backwards. These observations regarding sensitive dependence on initial conditions do not exactly illustrate the 80-20 principle. The examples given involve change over time, whereas the 80-20 principle involves a static breakdown of causes at any one time. Yet there is an important link between the two. Both phenomena help to show how the universe abhors balance. In the former case, we see a natural flight away from a 50-50 split of competing phenomena. A 51-49 split is inherently unstable and tends to gravitate towards a 95-5, 99-1 or even 100-0 split. Equality ends in dominance. That is one of the messages of chaos theory. The 80-20 principles message is different yet complementary. It tells us that at any one point, a majority of any phenomenon will be explained or caused by a minority of the actors participating in the phenomenon. 80% of the results come from 20% of the causes. A few things are important, most are not. The 80-20 principle sorts good movies from bad. One of the most dramatic examples of the 80-20 principle at work is with movies. Two economists made a study of the revenues and lifespans of 300 movies released over an 18-month period. They found that four movies, just 1.3% of the total, earned 80% of box office revenues. 
the other 296 movies, or 98.7%, earned only 20% of the gross. So movies, which are a good example of unrestricted markets at work, produce virtually an 81 rule, a very clear demonstration of the principle of imbalance. Even more intriguing is why. It transpires that moviegoers behave just like gas particles in random motion. As identified by chaos theory, gas particles, ping pong balls or moviegoers, all behave at random, but produce a predictably unbalanced result. Word of mouth from reviews and the first audiences determines whether the second set of audiences will be large or small, which determines the next set and so on. Movies like Independence Day or Mission Impossible continue to play to packed houses, while other star-studded and expensive movies like Waterworld or Daylight very quickly play to smaller and smaller houses, and then none at all. This is the 80-20 principle working with a vengeance. A guide to this guidebook. Chapter 2 explains how you can put the 80-20 principle into practice and explores the distinction between 80-20 analysis and 80-20 thinking, both of which are useful methods derived from the 80-20 principle. 80-20 analysis is a systematic, quantitative method of comparing causes and effects. 80-20 thinking is a broader, less precise and more intuitive procedure, comprising the mental models and habits that enable us to hypothesize what are the important causes of anything important in our lives, to identify these causes, and to make sharp improvements in our position by redeploying our resources accordingly. Part 2, Corporate Success Needn't Be a Mystery, summarizes the most powerful business uses of the 80-20 principle. These uses have been tried and tested and found to be of immense value, yet remain curiously unexploited by most of the business community. There is little in my summary that is original, but anyone seeking major profit improvement, whether for a small or large business, should find this a very useful primer and the first ever to appear in a book. Part 3, Work Less, Earn and Enjoy More, shows how the 80-20 principle can be used to raise the level at which you are operating in both your work and personal life. This is a pioneering attempt to apply the 80-20 principle on a novel canvas, and the attempt, although I am sure it is imperfect and incomplete in many ways, does lead to some surprising insights. For example, 80% of the typical person's happiness or achievement in life occurs in a small proportion of that life. The peaks of great personal value can usually be greatly expanded. The common view is that we are short of time. My application of the 80-20 principle suggests the reverse, that we are actually awash with time and profligate in its abuse. Part 4, Fresh Insights, the principle revisited, considers feedback I have received and how my thinking on the 80-20 principle has developed since the first edition of this book. Why the 80-20 principle brings good news. I want to end this introduction on a personal rather than a procedural note. I believe that the 80-20 principle is enormously hopeful. Certainly the principle brings home what may be evident anyway, that there is a tragic amount of waste everywhere in the way that nature operates, in business, in society, and in our own lives. If the typical pattern is for 80% of results to come from 20% of inputs, it is necessarily typical too that 80%, the great majority of inputs, are having only a marginal 20% impact. The paradox is that such waste can be wonderful news if we can use the 80-20 principle creatively, not just to identify and castigate low productivity, but to do something positive about it. There is enormous scope for improvement by rearranging and redirecting both nature and our own lives. Improving on nature, refusing to accept the status quo, is the root of all progress, evolutionary, scientific, 
social and personal. George Bernard Shaw put it well. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. The implication of the 80-20 principle is that output can be not just increased, but multiplied, if we can make the low productivity inputs nearly as productive as the high productivity inputs. Successful experiments with the 80-20 principle in the business arena suggest that, with creativity and determination, this leap in value can usually be made. There are two routes to achieving this. One is to reallocate the resources from unproductive to productive uses, the secret of all entrepreneurs down the ages. Find a round hole for a round peg, a square hole for a square peg, and a perfect fit for any shape in between. Experience suggests that every resource has its ideal arena, where the resource can be tens or hundreds of times more effective than in most other arenas. The other route to progress, the method of scientists, doctors, preachers, computer systems designers, educationalists and trainers, is to find ways to make the unproductive resources more effective, even in their existing applications to make the weak resources behave as though they were their more productive cousins, to mimic, if necessary, by intricate rote learning procedures, the highly productive resources. The few things that work fantastically well should be identified, cultivated, nurtured and multiplied. At the same time, the waste, the majority of things that will always prove to be of low value to man and beast, should be abandoned or severely cut back. As I've been writing this book and observed thousands of examples of the 80-20 principle, I have had my faith reinforced. Faith in progress, in great leaps forward, and in mankind's ability, individually and collectively, to improve the hand that nature has dealt. Joseph Ford comments, God plays dice with the universe, but they're loaded dice and the main objective is to find out by what rules they were loaded and how we can use them for our own ends. The 80-20 principle can help us achieve precisely that. Chapter 2. How to Think 80-20 Chapter 1 explained the concept behind the 80-20 principle. This chapter will discuss how the 80-20 principle works in practice and what it can do for you. Two applications of the principle, 80-20 analysis and 80-20 thinking, provide a practical philosophy which will help you understand and improve your life. Definition of the 80-20 principle The 80-20 principle states that there is an inbuilt imbalance between causes and results, inputs and outputs, and effort and reward. Typically, causes, inputs or effort divide into two categories. The majority that have little impact, a small minority that have a major, dominant impact. Typically also, results, outputs or rewards are derived from a small proportion of the causes, inputs or effort aimed at producing the results, outputs or rewards. The relationship between causes, inputs or efforts on the one hand and results, outputs or rewards on the other is therefore typically unbalanced. When this imbalance can be measured arithmetically, a good benchmark for the imbalance is the 80-20 relationship. 80% 80 of results, outputs or rewards are derived from only 20% of the causes, inputs or effort. About 80% of the world's energy is consumed by 15% of the world's population, for example. 80% of the world's wealth is possessed by 25% of the world's people. In healthcare, 20% of your population base and or 20% of its disease elements will consume 80% of your resources. Let us imagine, for example, that a company has 100 products and has found out that the most profitable 20 products account for 80% of all profits. It might help here to picture two piles. A big pile of the 100 products the company makes and a pile of cash that represents the profits made. Just one profitable product, 
1% of the total products, makes 20% of the profits. So, if you pull that particular widget out of the pile of products, you have to match it with the 20% of the money from the cash pile. If we continue counting the next most profitable product, and the next and the next, until we have the profits from the top 20 products, we end up with two pairs of piles. The first pair has one small pile of the top 20 products, and one big pile of cash representing 80% of the profits. The second pair is the flip side of this. There's a big pile, which is the company's other 80 products, and a small pile of cash to represent the profit they make, which is just 20% of total profits. The 80-20 numbers are only a benchmark, and the real relationship may be more or less unbalanced than 80-20. The 80-20 principle asserts, however, that in most cases the relationship is much more likely to be closer to 80-20 than to 50-50. If all of the products in our example made the same profit, then the relationship would be shown as corresponding piles of cash and products of equal size. The curious but crucial point is that when such investigations are conducted, imbalance is much more common than balance. Of course, the exact relationship may not be 80-20. 80-20 is both a convenient metaphor and a useful hypothesis, but it is not the only pattern. Sometimes 80% of the profits come from 30% of the products. And sometimes 80% of the profits come from 15% or even 10% of the products. The numbers compared do not have to add up to 100, but the picture usually looks unbalanced. There's a bigger pile of cash paired with a smaller pile of products, rather than piles of cash and goods of about the same size. It is perhaps unfortunate that the numbers 80 and 20 add up to 100. This makes the result look elegant, as indeed would a result of 50-50, 70-30, 99-1, or many other combinations. And it is certainly memorable. But it makes many people think that we are dealing with just one set of data. One 100%. Well, this is not so. If 80% of people are right-handed and 20% are left-handed, this is not an 80-20 observation. To apply the 80-20 principle, you have to have two sets of data, both adding up to 100%, and one measuring a variable quantity owned, exhibited, or caused by the people or things making up the other 100%. What the 80-20 principle can do for you. Every person I have known who has taken the 80-20 principle seriously has emerged with useful and, in some cases, life-changing insights. You have to work out your own uses for the principle. They will be there if you look creatively. Part 3, chapters 9 to 15, will guide you on your odyssey, but I can illustrate with some examples from my own life. How the 80-20 principle has helped me. When I was a raw student at Oxford, my tutor told me never to go to lectures. Books can be read far faster, he explained. But never read a book from cover to cover, except for pleasure. When you are working, find out what the book is saying much faster than you would by reading it through. Read the conclusion, then the introduction, then the conclusion again, then dip lightly into any interesting bits. What he was really saying was that 80% of the value of a book can be found in 20% or fewer of its pages and absorbed in 20% of the time most people would take to read it through. I took to this study method and extended it. At Oxford, there is no system of continuous assessment and the class of degree earned depends entirely on finals, the examinations taken at the end of the course. I discovered from the form book that is by analysing past examination papers, that at least 80%, sometimes 100%, of an examination could be well answered with knowledge from 20% or fewer of the subjects that the exam was meant to cover. The examiners could therefore be much better impressed by a student who knew an awful lot about relatively little, rather than a fair amount about a great deal. This insight enabled me to study very efficiently. Somehow, without working very hard, 
I ended up with a congratulatory first-class degree. I used to think this proved that Oxford dons were gullible. I now prefer to think, perhaps improbably, that they were teaching us how the world worked. I went to work for Shell, serving my time at a dreadful oil refinery. This may have been very good for my soul, but I rapidly realised that the best-paying jobs for young and inexperienced people such as I lay in management consultancy. So I went to Philadelphia and picked up an effortless MBA from Wharton, scorning the boot camp style so-called learning experience from Harvard. I joined a leading US consultancy that on day one paid me four times what Shell had paid me when I left. No doubt, 80% of the money to be had by people of my tender age was concentrated in 20% of the jobs. Since there were too many colleagues in the consultancy who were smarter than me, I moved to another US strategy boutique. I identified it because it was growing faster than the firm I had joined, yet had a much smaller proportion of really smart people. Who you work for is more important than what you do. Here I stumbled across many paradoxes of the 80-20 principle. 80% 80 of the growth in the strategy consultancy industry, then as now growing like gangbusters, was being appropriated by firms that then had, in total, fewer than 20% of the industry's professional staff. 80% of rapid promotions were also available in just a handful of firms. Believe me, talent had very little to do with it. When I left the first strategy firm and joined the second, I raised the average level of intelligence in both. Yet the puzzling thing was that my new colleagues were more effective than my old ones. Why? They didn't work any harder, but they followed the 80-20 principle in two key ways. First, they realised that for most firms, 80% of profits come from 20% of clients. In the consulting industry, that means two things. Large clients and long-term clients. Large clients give large assignments, which means you can use a higher proportion of lower-cost, younger consultants. Long-term client relationships create trust and raise the cost to the client of switching to another consulting firm. Long-term clients tend not to be price-sensitive. In most consulting firms, the real excitement comes from winning new clients. In my new firm, the real heroes were those who worked on the largest existing clients for the longest possible time. And they did this by cultivating the top bosses of those client corporations. The second key insight the consulting firm had was that in any client, 80% of the results available would flow from concentrating on the 20% of most important issues. These were not necessarily the most interesting ones from a curious consultant's viewpoint. But whereas our competitors would look superficially at a whole range of issues and then leave them for the client to act or not on the recommendations, we kept plugging away at the most important issues until we had bludgeoned the client into successful action. The client's profits often soared as a result, as did our consulting budgets. Are you working to make others rich, or is it the reverse? I soon became convinced that, for both consultants and their clients, effort and reward were at best only loosely linked. It was better to be in the right place than to be smart and work hard. It was best to be cunning and focus on results rather than inputs. Acting on a few key insights produced the goods. Being intelligent and hard-working did not. Sadly, for many years, guilt and conformity to peer group pressure kept me from fully acting on this lesson. I worked far too hard. By this time, the consulting firm had several hundred professional staff and about 30 people, including myself, who were called partners. But 80% of the profits went to one man, the founder, even though numerically he constituted less than 4% of the partnership and a fraction of 1% of the consulting force. Instead of continuing to enrich the founder, two other junior partners and I spun off to set up our own firm, doing exactly the same thing. 
we in turn grew to have hundreds of consultants. Before long, although the three of us on any measure did less than 20% of the firm's valuable work, we enjoyed over 80% of the profits. This too caused me guilt. After six years I quit, selling my shares to the other partners. At this time, we had doubled our revenues and profits every year and I was able to secure a good price for my shares. Shortly after, the recession of 1990 hit the consulting industry. Although I will counsel you later to give up guilt, I was lucky with my guilt. Even those who follow the 80-20 principle need a bit of luck, and I have always enjoyed far more than my share. This is the end of CD1. The book continues on CD2. CD2. Wealth from investment can dwarf wealth from working. With 20% of the money received, I made a large investment in the shares of one corporation, Filofax. Investment advisors were horrified. At the time, I owned about 20 shares in quoted public companies, but this one stock, 5% of the number of shares I owned, accounted for about 80% of my portfolio. Fortunately, the proportion proceeded to grow still further, as over the next three years, Filofax shares multiplied several times in value. When I sold some shares in 1995, it was at nearly 18 times the price I had paid for my first stake. I made two other large investments, one in a start-up restaurant called Belgo and the other in MSI, a hotel company that at the time owned no hotels. Together, these three investments at cost comprised about 20% of my net worth but they have accounted for more than 80% of my subsequent investment gains and now comprise over 80% of a much larger net worth. As Chapter 14 will show, 80% of the increase in wealth from most long-term portfolios comes from fewer than 20% of the investments. It is crucial to pick this 20% well and then concentrate as much investment as possible into it. Conventional wisdom is not to put all your eggs in one basket. 80-20 wisdom is to choose a basket carefully, load all your eggs into it, and then watch it like a hawk. How to use the 80-20 principle. There are two ways to use the 80-20 principle. Traditionally, the 80-20 principle has required 80-20 analysis, a quantitative method to establish the precise relationship between causes, input, effort, and results, outputs, rewards. This method uses the possible existence of the 80-20 relationship as a hypothesis and then gathers the facts so that the true relationship is revealed. This is an empirical procedure which may lead to any result ranging from 50-50 to 99.9 0.1. If the result does demonstrate a marked imbalance between inputs and outputs, say a 65-35 relationship, or an even more unbalanced one, then normally action is taken as a result. A new and complementary way to use the 80-20 principle is what I call 80-20 thinking. This requires deep thought about any issue that is important to you, and asks you to make a judgement on whether the 80-20 principle is working in that area. You can then act on the insight. 80-20 thinking does not require you to collect data or actually test the hypothesis. Consequently, 80-20 thinking may on occasion mislead you. It is dangerous to assume, for example, that you already know what the 20% is if you identify a relationship. But I will argue that 80-20 thinking is much less likely to mislead you than is conventional thinking. 80-20 thinking is much more accessible and faster than 80-20 analysis, although the latter may be preferred when the issue is extremely important and you find it difficult to be confident about an estimate. 
we look first at 80-20 analysis and then at 80-20 thinking. 80-20 analysis. 80-20 analysis examines the relationship between two sets of comparable data. One set of data is always a universe of people or objects, usually a large number of a hundred or more, that can be turned into a percentage. The other set of data relates to some interesting characteristic of the people or objects that can be measured and also turned into a percentage. For example, we might decide to look at a group of a hundred friends, all of whom are at least occasional beer drinkers, and compare how much beer they drank last week. So far, this method of analysis is common to many statistical techniques. What makes 80-20 analysis unique is that the measurement ranks the second set of data in descending order of importance and makes comparisons between percentages in the two sets of data. In our example, then, we will ask all our 100 friends how many glasses of beer they drank last week and array the answers in a table in descending order. 80-20 analysis can compare percentages from the two sets of data, and the friends and the amount of beer drunk. In this case, we can say that 70% of the beer was drunk by just 20% of the friends. This would therefore give us a 70-20 relationship. We can summarise this data visually in an 80-20 frequency distribution chart, or 80-20 chart for short. In this chart, the vertical axis is the glasses of beer drunk, and the horizontal axis is the 100 beer drinkers. The data on the chart looks a bit like a coastal cliff, first a downward sloping hill, then a sudden dramatic drop off to a wide flat beach, then a small further drop to the sea. The big drop comes just after our 20th drinker, the beach is our middle 60 drinkers, and the sea is the bottom 20 drinkers. Why is this called 80-20 analysis? When comparing these relationships, the most frequent observation made long ago, probably in the 1950s, was that 80% of the quantity being measured came from 20% of the people or objects. 80-20 has become shorthand for this type of unbalanced relationship, whether or not the precise result is 80-20. Statistically, an exact 80-20 relationship is unlikely. It is the convention of 80-20 that it is the top 20% of causes that is cited, not the bottom. 80-20 analysis is my name for the way that the 80-20 principle has generally been used to date, that is, in a quantitative and empirical way, to measure possible relationships between inputs and outputs. We could equally well observe from the data on our beer-drinking friends that the bottom 20% of people only consumed 30 glasses, or 3% of the total. It would also be perfectly legitimate to call this a 320 relationship, although this is rarely done. The emphasis is nearly always on the heavy users or causes. If a brewery was conducting a promotion, or wanted to find out what beer drinkers thought about their range of beers, it would be most useful to go to the top 20. We might also want to know what percentage of our friends combine to account for 80% of total beer consumption. In this case, inspection would show that Mike G, the 28th biggest drinker with 10 glasses, took the cumulative total to 800 glasses. We could express this relationship, therefore, as 80-28. 80% of total beer was drunk by just 28% of our friends. It should be clear from this example that 80-20 analysis may result in any set of findings. Clearly, individual findings are more interesting and potentially more useful where there is an imbalance. If, for example, we have found that all of our friends had drunk exactly eight glasses each, the brewery would not have been very interested in using our group for promotional research. In this case, we would have had a 20-20 relationship 20% of beer was drunk by the top 20% of friends, or an 80-80 relationship. 80% of beer was drunk by 80% of friends. Bar charts show 80-20 relationships best. An 80-20 analysis is best displayed pictorially by looking at two bars, 
which is particularly appropriate for our example. Our earlier examples with the piles of products and profits can also be represented by bar charts. Imagine two vertical bars side by side, like two tall windows. The first bar represents our 100 beer drinking friends, each filling 1% of the space, starting with the biggest beer drinker at the top and ending with the smallest beer drinkers at the bottom. The second bar represents the total amount of beer drunk by each and all of our friends. We can choose any given percentage of our friends and see how much beer they accounted for. For example, if we painted in the top 20% of the first bar or window, our top 20 drinkers, we would have to paint in 70% of the second bar or window, because that's how much beer those 20 people drank. In other words, the two bars would show what we discovered by putting the data in a table or in the 80-20 chart described earlier, that the top 20% of beer drinkers accounted for 70% of the beer drunk. The bar chart just takes the data and displays it from top to bottom instead of left to right. It doesn't matter which display you prefer. If we wanted to illustrate what percentage of our friends drank 80% of the beer, we would fill in the bars slightly differently to show the 80-28 relationship. 28% of our friends drank 80% of the beer. What is 80-20 analysis used for? Generally, to change the relationship it describes or to make better use of it. One use is to concentrate on the key causes of the relationship, the 20% of inputs that lead to 80%, or whatever the precise number is, of the outputs. If the top 20% of beer drinkers account for 70% of beer consumed, this is a group that a brewery should concentrate on reaching in order to attract as high a share as possible of the business from the 20%, and possibly also to increase their beer consumption still further. For all practical purposes, the brewery may decide to ignore the 80% of beer drinkers who only consume 30% of the beer. This simplifies the task immensely. Similarly, a firm that finds that 80% of its profits come from 20% of its customers should use this information to concentrate on keeping that 20% happy, and increasing the business carried out with them. This is much easier, as well as more rewarding, than paying equal attention to the whole customer group. Or, if the firm finds that 80% of its profits come from 20% of its products, it should put most of its efforts behind selling more of those products. The same idea applies to non-business applications of 80-20 analysis. If you analyse the enjoyment you derive from all your leisure activities and found that 80% of the enjoyment derived from 20% of the activities, which currently took only 20% of your leisure time, it would make sense to increase the time allocation from 20 to at least 80%. Take transport as another example. 80% of traffic jams occur on 20% of roads. If you drive on the same route to work each day, you will know that roughly 80% of delays usually occur at 20% of the intersections. A sensible reaction would be for traffic authorities to pay particular attention to traffic phasing on those 20% of jam-creating intersections. While the expense of such phasing might be too much for 100% of junctions, 100% of the time, it would be money well spent in the key 20% of locations for 20% of the day. The second main use of 80-20 analysis is to do something about the underperforming 80% of inputs that contribute only 20% of the output. Perhaps the occasional beer drinkers can be persuaded to drink more, for example by providing a blander product. Perhaps you could work out ways to get greater enjoyment out of the underperforming leisure activities. In education, Interactive teaching systems now replicate the technique used by college professors where questions are addressed randomly to any student in order to combat the 80-20 rule, where 80% of classroom participation comes from 20% of the trainees. In US shopping malls, it has been found that women, some 50% of the population, account for 70% of the dollar value of all purchases. 
One way to increase the 30% of sales to men might be to build stores specifically designed for them. Although this second application of 80-20 analysis is sometimes very useful and has been put to great effect in industry in improving the productivity of underperforming factories, it is generally harder work and less rewarding than the first use. Don't apply 80-20 analysis in a linear way. In discussing the uses of 80-20 analysis, we must also briefly address its potential abuses. Like any simple and effective tool, 80-20 analysis can also be misunderstood, misapplied and, instead of being the means to an unusual insight, serve as the justification for conventional thuggery. 80-20 analysis, applied inappropriately and in a linear way, can also lead the innocent astray. You need constantly to be vigilant against false logic. Let me illustrate this with an example from the book trade. It is easy to demonstrate that, in most times and places, about 20% of book titles comprise about 80% of books sold. For those who are steeped in the 80-20 principle, this is not surprising. It might seem a short hop to the conclusion that bookshops should cut the range of books they stock or, indeed, that they should concentrate largely or exclusively on bestsellers. Yet what is interesting is that in most cases, instead of sending profits up, restricting range has sent profits down. This does not invalidate the 80-20 principle for two reasons. The key consideration is not the distribution of books sold, but what customers want. If customers go to the trouble of visiting a bookstore, they want to find a reasonable range of books, as opposed to a kiosk or supermarket where they don't expect range. Bookstores should concentrate on the 20% of customers who account for 80% of their profits and find out what those 20% of customers want. The other reason is that what matters even when considering books, as opposed to customers, is not the distribution of sales, the 20% of books that represent 80% of sales, but the distribution of profits, the 20% of titles that generate 80% of profits. Very often, these are not the so-called bestsellers, books written by well-known authors. In fact, a study in the US revealed that Best sellers represent about 5% of total sales. The true best sellers are often those books that never make it into the charts, but sell a reliable quantity year in and year out, often at high margins. As the same US research comments, core inventory represents those books that sell season in and season out. They are the 80 in the 80-20 rule, often accounting for the lion's share of sales in a particular subject. This illustration is salutary. It does not invalidate 80-20 analysis at all, since the key questions should always be which customers and products generate 80% of profits. But it does show the danger of not thinking clearly enough about how the analysis is applied. When using the 80-20 principle, be selective and be contrarian. Don't be seduced into thinking that the variable that everyone else is looking at, in this case the books on the latest bestseller list, is what really matters. This is linear thinking. The most valuable insight from 80-20 analysis will always come from examining non-linear relationships that others are neglecting. In addition, because 80-20 analysis is based on a freeze frame of the situation at a particular point, rather than incorporating changes over time, you must be aware that if you inadvertently freeze the wrong or an incomplete picture, you will get an inaccurate view. 80-20 thinking and why it is necessary. 80-20 analysis is extremely useful. But most people are not natural analysts, and even analysts cannot stop to investigate the data every time they have to make a decision. It would bring life to a shuddering halt. Most important decisions have never been made by analysis, and never will be, however clever our computers become. Therefore, 
if we want the 80-20 principle to be a guide in our daily lives, we need something less analytical and more instantly available than 80-20 analysis. We need 80-20 thinking. 80-20 thinking is my phrase for the application of the 80-20 principle to daily life, for non-quantitative applications of the principle. As with 80-20 analysis, we start with a hypothesis about a possible imbalance between inputs and outputs, but instead of collecting data and analysing them, we estimate them. 80-20 thinking requires, and with practice enables, us to spot the few really important things that are happening and ignore the mass of unimportant things. It teaches us to see the wood for the trees. 80-20 thinking is too valuable to be confined to causes where data and analysis are perfect. For every ounce of insight generated quantitatively, there must be many pounds of insight arrived at intuitively and impressionistically. This is why 80-20 thinking, although helped by data, must not be constrained by it. To engage in 80-20 thinking, we must constantly ask ourselves, what is the 20% that is leading to 80%? We must never assume that we automatically know what the answer is, but take some time to think creatively about it. What are the vital few inputs or causes, as opposed to the trivial many? Where is the haunting melody being drowned by the background noise? 80-20 thinking is then used in the same way as the results from 80-20 analysis, to change behaviour and, normally, to concentrate on the most important 20%. You know that 80-20 thinking is working when it multiplies effectiveness. Action resulting from 80-20 thinking should lead us to get much more from much less. When we are using the 80-20 principle, we do not assume that its results are good or bad, or that the powerful forces we observe are necessarily good. We decide whether they are good from our own perspective and either determine to give the minority of powerful forces a further shove in the right direction or work out how to frustrate their operation. The 80-20 principle turns conventional wisdom upside down. Application of the 80-20 principle implies that we should do the following. Celebrate exceptional productivity rather than raise average efforts. Look for the shortcut rather than run the full course. Exercise control over our lives with the least possible effort. Be selective, not exhaustive. Strive for excellence in few things rather than good performance in many. Delegate or outsource as much as possible in our daily lives and be encouraged rather than penalised by tax systems to do this. Use gardeners, car mechanics, decorators and other specialists to the maximum instead of doing the work ourselves. Choose our careers and employers with extraordinary care and if possible employ others rather than being employed ourselves. Only do the thing we are best at doing and enjoy most. Look beneath the normal texture of life to uncover ironies and oddities. In every important sphere, work out where 20% of effort can lead to 80% of returns. Calm down, work less and target a limited number of very valuable goals where the 80-20 principle will work for us rather than pursuing every available opportunity. Make the most of those few lucky streaks in our life where we are at our creative peak and the stars line up to guarantee success. There are no boundaries to the 80-20 principle. No sphere of activity is immune from the influence of the 80-20 principle. Like the six wise, blind Indian men who tried to discern the shape of an elephant, most users of the 80-20 principle only know a fraction of its scope and power. Becoming an 80-20 thinker requires active participation and creativity on your part. If you want to benefit from 80-20 thinking, you have to do it. Now is a good time to start. 
If you want to begin with applications for your organisation, go straight on to part two, which documents most of the important business applications of the 80-20 principle. If you are more immediately interested in using the principle to make major improvements in your life, skip to part three, a novel attempt to relate the 80-20 principle to the fabric of our daily lives. Part 2. Corporate success needn't be a mystery. Chapter 3. The Underground Cult. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. It is difficult to gauge the extent to which the 80-20 principle is already known in business. This is almost certainly the first book on the subject, yet in my research I was easily able to find several hundred articles referring to the use of 80-20 in all kinds of businesses all over the world. Many successful firms and individuals swear by the use of the 80-20 principle, and most holders of MBAs have heard of it. Yet considering that the 80-20 principle has affected the lives of hundreds of millions of people, even though they may be unaware of it, it remains strangely uncelebrated. It is time to put this right. The first 80-20 wave. The Quality Revolution. The quality revolution that took place between 1950 and 1990 transformed the quality and value of branded consumer goods and other manufacturers. The quality movement has been a crusade to obtain consistently higher quality at lower cost by the application of statistical and behavioural techniques. The objective, now almost reached with many products, is to obtain a zero rate of product defects. It is possible to argue that the quality movement has been the most significant driver of higher living standards throughout the world since 1950. The movement has an intriguing history. Its two great messiahs, Joseph Duran, born 1904, and W. Edwards Deming, born 1900, were both Americans, although Duran was born in Romania. Respectively an electrical engineer and a statistician, they developed their ideas in parallel after the Second World War, but found it impossible to interest any major US corporation in the quest for extraordinary quality. Duran published the first edition of his Quality Control Handbook, the Bible of the Quality Movement, in 1951, but it received a very flat reception. The only serious interest came from Japan, and both Duran and Deming moved there in the early 1950s. Their pioneering work took an economy known at the time for shoddy imitations and transformed it into a powerhouse of high quality and productivity. It was only when Japanese goods, such as motorcycles and photocopiers, began to invade the US market that most American and other Western corporations started to take the quality movement seriously. From 1970, and especially after 1980, Duran, Deming and their disciples undertook an equally successful transformation of Western quality standards, leading to huge improvements in the level and consistency of quality, dramatic reductions in fault rates and large falls in manufacturing costs. The 80-20 principle was one of the key building blocks of the quality movement. Joseph Duran was the most enthusiastic messiah of the principle, although he called it the Pareto principle, or the rule of the vital few. In the first edition of the Quality Control Handbook, Duran commented that losses, that is, manufactured goods that have to be rejected because of poor quality, do not arise from a large number of causes. Rather, the losses are always maldistributed in such a way that a small percentage of the quality characteristics always contributes a high percentage of the quality loss. And a footnote commented that 
The economist Pareto found that wealth was non-uniformly distributed in the same way. Many other instances can be found. The distribution of crime amongst criminals, the distribution of accidents among hazardous processes, etc. Pareto's principle of unequal distribution applied to distribution of wealth and to distribution of quality losses. Duran applied the AT20 principle to statistical quality control. The approach is to identify the problems causing lack of quality and to rank them from the most important, the 20% of defects causing 80% of quality problems, to the least important. Both Duran and Deming came to use the phrase AT20 increasingly, encouraging diagnosis of the few defects causing most of the problems. Once the vital few sources of off-quality product have been identified, effort is focused on dealing with these issues rather than trying to tackle all the problems at once. As the quality movement has progressed from an emphasis on quality control through to the view that quality must be built into products in the first place by all operators and to total quality management and increasingly sophisticated use of software, the emphasis on 80-20 techniques has grown so that today almost all quality practitioners are familiar with 80-20. Some recent references illustrate the ways in which the 80-20 principle is now being used. In a recent article in the National Productivity Review, Ronald J. Ricardo asks, Which gaps adversely affect your most strategic consumers? As with many other quality problems, Pareto's law prevails here too. If you remedy the most critical 20% of your quality gaps, you will realise 80% of the benefits. This first 80% typically includes your breakthrough improvements. Another writer, focusing on corporate turnarounds, comments, For every step in your business process, ask yourself if it adds value or provides essential support. If it does neither, it's waste. Cut it. This is the 80-20 rule revisited. You can eliminate 80% of the waste by spending only 20% of what it would cost you to get rid of 100% of the waste. Go for the quick gain now. The 80-20 principle was also used by Ford Electronics Manufacturing Corporation in a quality program that won the Shingo Prize. Just-in-time programs have been applied using the 80-20 rule. 80% of the value is spread over 20% of the volume and top dollar usages are analysed constantly. Labour and overhead performance were replaced by manufacturing cycle time analysis by product line, reducing product cycle time by 95%. New software incorporating the 80-20 principle is being used to raise quality. With the ABC data analyzer, the data is entered or imported into the spreadsheet area, where you highlight it and click on your choice of six graph types, histograms, control charts, run charts, scatter diagrams, pie charts, and Pareto charts. The Pareto chart incorporates the 80 to 20 rule, which might show, for instance, that out of 1,000 customer complaints, roughly 800 can be eliminated by correcting only 20% of the causes. The 80-20 principle is also increasingly being applied to product design and development. For example, a review of the use that the Pentagon has made of total quality management explains that decisions made early in the development process fix the majority of life cycle costs. The 80-20 rule describes this outcome, since 80% of the life cycle costs are usually locked in after only 20% of the development time. The impact of the quality revolution on customer satisfaction and value and on the competitive positions of individual firms and indeed of whole nations has been little noted but is truly massive. The 80-20 principle was clearly one of the vital few inputs to the quality revolution. But the underground influence of the 80-20 principle did not stop there. It also played a key role in a second revolution that combined with the first to create today's global consumer society.
the second 8020 wave, the information revolution. The information revolution that began in the 1960s has already transformed work habits and the efficiency of large tracts of business. It is just beginning to do more than this, to help change the nature of the organisations that are today's dominant force in society. The 8020 principle was, is and will be a key accessory of the information revolution, helping to direct its force intelligently. Perhaps because they were close to the quality movement, the computing and software professionals behind the information revolution were generally familiar with the 8020 principle and used it extensively. To judge by the number of computing and software articles that refer to the 8020 principle, most hardware and software developers understand and use it in their daily work. The information revolution has been most effective when using the 8020 principles concepts of selectivity and simplicity. As two separate project directors testify, think small, don't plan to the nth degree on the first day. The return on investment usually follows the 8020 rule. 80% of the benefits will be found in the simplest 20% of the system and the final 20% of the benefits will come from the most complex 80% of the system. Apple used the 8020 principle in developing the Apple Newton message pad, an electronic personal organiser. The Newton engineers took advantage of a slightly modified version of 8020. They found that 0.01% of a person's vocabulary was sufficient to do 50% of the things you want to do with a small handheld computer. Increasingly, software is substituting for hardware using the 8020 principle. An example is the RISC software invented in 1994. RISC is based on a variation of the 8020 rule. This rule assumes that most software spends 80% of its time executing only 20% of the available instructions. RISC processes optimise the performance of that 20% and keep chip size and cost down by eliminating the other 80%. RISC does in software what CISC, the previously dominant system, does in silicon. Those who apply software know that, even though it is incredibly efficient, usage follows 80-20 patterns. As one developer states, the business world has long abided by the 80-20 rule. It's especially true for software, where 80% of a product's uses take advantage of only 20% of its capabilities. That means that most of us pay for what we don't want or need. Software developers finally seem to understand this, and many are betting that modular applications will solve the problem. Design of software is crucial, so that the most used functions are the easiest to use. The same approach has been used for new database services. How do software developers do it? First, they identify what customers want most of the time and how they want to do it. The old 80-20 rule. People use 20% of a program's functions 80% of the time. Good software developers make high-use functions as simple and automatic and inevitable as possible. Translating such an approach to today's database services would mean looking at key customer use all the time. How many times do customers call search service support desks to ask which file to pick or where a file can be found? Good design could eliminate such calls. Wherever one turns, effective innovations in information, in data storage, retrieval and processing, focus heavily on the up to 20% of key needs. The information revolution has a long way to run. The information revolution is the most subversive force business has ever known. Already the phenomenon of information power to the people has given knowledge and authority to frontline workers and technicians, destroying the power and often the jobs of middle management who were previously protected by proprietary knowledge. The information revolution has also decentralised corporations physically. 
the phone, the PC, broadband, and the increasing miniaturization and mobility of these technologies have already begun to destroy the power of corporate palaces and those who sit or used to sit in them. Ultimately, the information revolution will help to destroy the profession of management itself, thus enabling much greater direct value creation by doers in corporations for their key customers. The value of automated information is increasing exponentially, much faster than we can use it. The key to using this power effectively, now and in the future, lies in selectivity, in applying the 80-20 principle. Peter Drucker points the way. A database, no matter how copious, is not information. It is information's ore. The information a business most depends on is available, if at all, only in a primitive and disorganised form. For what a business needs the most for its decisions, especially its strategic ones, are data about what goes on outside of it. It is only outside the business where there are results, opportunities and threats. Drucker argues that we need new ways of measuring wealth creation. Ian Godden and I call these new tools automated performance measures. They are just beginning to be created by some corporations. But well over 80%, probably around 99%, of the information revolution's resources are still being applied to counting better what we used to count, paving over the cowpats, rather than creating and simplifying measures of genuine corporate wealth creation. The tiny proportion of effort that uses the information revolution to create a different sort of corporation will have an explosive impact. The 80-20 principle is still the best-kept business secret. Considering the importance of the 80-20 principle and the extent to which it is known by managers, it remains extremely discreet. Even the 80-20 term itself caught on very slowly and without any visible landmarks. Given the piecemeal use and gradual spread of the 80-20 principle, it remains underexploited, even by those who recognise the idea. It is extremely versatile. It can be profitably applied to any industry and any organisation, any function within an organisation and any individual job. The 80-20 principle can help the chief executive, line managers, functional specialists and any knowledge worker down to the lowest level or the newest trainee. And although its uses are manifold, there is an underlying unifying logic that explains why the 80-20 principle works and is so valuable. Why the 80-20 principle works in business? The 80-20 principle applied to business has one key theme, to generate the most money with the least expenditure of assets and effort. The classical economists of the 19th and early 20th centuries developed a theory of economic equilibrium and of the firm that has dominated thinking ever since. The theory states that under perfect competition, firms do not make excess returns and profitability is either zero or the normal cost of capital, the latter usually being defined by a modest interest charge. The theory is internally consistent and has the sole flaw that it cannot be applied to real economic activity of any kind, and especially not to the operations of any individual firm. The 80-20 theory of the firm. In contrast to the theory of perfect competition, the 80-20 theory of the firm is both verifiable, and has in fact been verified many times, and helpful as a guide to action. The 80-20 theory of the firm goes like this. In any market, some supplies will be much better than others at satisfying customer needs. These supplies will obtain the highest price realisations and also the highest market shares. In any market, some supplies will be much better than others at minimising expenditure relative to revenues. In other words, these suppliers' products will cost less than other suppliers for equivalent output and revenue, 
Or alternatively, they will be able to generate equivalent output with lower expenditure. Some suppliers will generate much higher surpluses than others. I use the phrase surpluses rather than profits because the latter normally implies the profit available for shareholders. The concept of surplus implies the level of funds available for profits or reinvestment over and above what is needed normally to keep the wheels turning. Higher surpluses will result in one or more of the following. One, greater reinvestment in product and service to produce greater superiority and appeal to customers. Two, investment in gaining market share through greater sales and marketing effort and or takeovers of other firms. Three, higher returns to employees, which will tend to have the effect of retaining and attracting the best people in the market. And or, four, higher returns to shareholders, which will tend to raise share prices and lower the cost of capital, facilitating investment and or takeovers. Over time, 80% of the market will tend to be supplied by 20% or fewer of the suppliers, who will normally also be more profitable. At this point, it is possible that the market structure may reach an equilibrium, although it will be a very different kind of equilibrium from that beloved of the economist's perfect competition model. In the 80-20 equilibrium, a few suppliers, the largest, will offer customers better value for money and have higher profits than smaller rivals. This is frequently observed in real life, despite being impossible according to the theory of perfect competition. We may term our more realistic theory the 80-20 law of competition. But the real world does not generally rest long in a tranquil equilibrium. Sooner or later, usually sooner, there are always changes to market structure caused by competitors' innovations. Both existing suppliers and new suppliers will seek to innovate and obtain a high share of a small but defensible part of each market, a market segment. Segmentation of this kind is possible by providing a more specialised product or service ideally suited to particular types of customer. Over time, markets will tend to comprise more market segments. Within each of these segments, the 80-20 law of competition will operate. The leaders in each specialist segment may either be firms operating largely or exclusively in that segment or industry generalists, but their success will be dependent in each segment on obtaining the greatest revenue with the lowest expenditure of effort. In each segment, some firms will be much better than others at doing this and will tend to accumulate segment market share as a result. Any large firm will operate in a large number of segments, that is, in a large number of customer-product combinations where a different formula is required to maximise revenue relative to effort and or where different competitors are met. In some of these segments, the individual large firm will generate large surpluses and in other segments much lower surpluses or even deficits. It will tend to be true, therefore, that 80% of surpluses or profits are generated by 20% of segments and by 20% of customers and by 20% of products. The most profitable segments will tend to, but will not always, be where the firm enjoys the highest market shares and where the firm has the most loyal customers, loyalty being defined by being long-standing and least likely to defect to competitors. Within any firm, as with all entities dependent on nature and human endeavour, there is likely to be an inequality between inputs and outputs, an imbalance between effort and reward. Externally, this is reflected in the fact that some markets, products and customers are much more profitable than others. Internally, the same principle is reflected by the fact that some resources, be they people, factories, machines or permutations of these, will produce very much more value relative to their cost than will other resources. If we were able to measure it, as we can with some jobs such as those of salespeople, we would find that some people generate a very large surplus, 
their attributable share of revenue is very much greater than their full cost, whereas many people generate a small surplus or a deficit. Firms that generate the largest surpluses also tend to have the highest average surplus per employee. But in all firms, the true surplus generated by each employee tends to be very unequal. 80% of the surplus is usually generated by 20% of employees. At the lowest level of aggregation of resources within the firm, for example an individual employee, 80% of the value created is likely to be generated in a small part, approximately 20%, of the time when, through a combination of circumstances, including personal characteristics and the exact nature of the task, the employee is operating at several times his or her normal level of effectiveness. The principles of unequal effort and return therefore operate at all levels of business, markets, market segments, products, customers, departments and employees. It is this lack of balance, rather than a notional equilibrium, that characterises all economic activity. Apparently small differences create large consequences. A product has only to be 10% better value than that of a competing product to generate a sales difference of 50% and a profit difference of 100%. Three action implications. One implication of the 80-20 theory of firms is that successful firms operate in markets where it is possible for that firm to generate the highest revenues with the least effort. This will be true both absolutely, that is, relative to monetary profits, and relatively, that is, in relation to competition. A firm cannot be judged successful unless it has a high absolute surplus, in traditional terms, a high return on investment, and also a higher surplus than its competitors, higher margins. A second practical implication for all firms is that it is always possible to raise the economic surplus, usually by a large degree, by focusing only on those market and customer segments where the larger surpluses are currently being generated. This will always imply redeployment of resources into the most surplus generating segments and will normally also imply a reduction in the total level of resource and expenditure. In plain words, fewer employees and other costs. Firms rarely reach the highest level of surplus that they could attain, or anywhere near it, both because managers are often not aware of the potential for surplus, and because they often prefer to run large firms rather than exceptionally profitable ones. A third corollary is that it is possible for every corporation to raise the level of surplus by reducing the inequality of output and reward within the firm. This can be done by identifying the parts of the firm – people, factories, sales offices, overhead units, countries – that generate the higher surpluses and reinforcing these, giving them more power and resources, and conversely, identifying the resources generating low or negative surpluses, facilitating dramatic improvements and, if these are not forthcoming, stopping the expenditure on these resources. These principles constitute a useful 80-20 theory of the firm, but they must not be interpreted too rigidly or deterministically. The principles work because they are a reflection of relationships in nature, which are an intricate mixture of order and disorder, of regularity and irregularity. Look for irregular insights from the 80-20 principle. It is important to try to grasp the fluidity and force driving 80-20 relationships. Unless you appreciate this, you will interpret the 80-20 principle too rigidly and fail to exploit its full potential. The world is full of small causes that, when combined, can have momentous consequences. Think of a saucepan of milk that, when heated above a certain temperature, suddenly changes form, swelling up and bubbling over. One moment you have a nice orderly pan of hot milk. The next moment you can either have a wonderful cappuccino or, 
if you are a second too late, a mess on top of your stove. Things take a little more time in business, but one year you can have an excellent and very profitable IBM dominating the computer industry, and before long, a combination of small causes resulting in a blinded monolith staggering to avoid destruction. Creative systems operate away from equilibrium. Cause and effect, input and output, operate in a non-linear way. You do not usually get back what you put in. You may sometimes get very much less and sometimes get very much more. Major alterations in a business system can flow from apparently insignificant causes. At any one time, people of equal intelligence, skill and dedication can produce quite unequal results as a result of small structural differences. Events cannot be predicted, although predictable patterns tend to recur. Identify lucky streaks. Control is therefore impossible. But it is possible to influence events and, perhaps even more important, it is possible to detect irregularities and benefit from them. The art of using the 80-20 principle is to identify which way the grain of reality is currently running and to exploit that as much as possible. Imagine you are in a crazy casino full of unbalanced roulette wheels. All numbers pay odds of 35 to 1, but individual numbers come up more or less frequently at different tables. At one, number five comes up one time in 20. At another table, it only comes up one time in 50. If you back the right number at the right table, you can make a fortune. And if you stubbornly keep backing number five at a table where it comes up one time in 50, your money will all disappear, regardless of how high your starting bank. If you can identify where your firm is getting back more than it is putting in, you can up the stakes and make a killing. Similarly, if you can work out where your firm is getting back much less than it is investing, you can cut your losses. In this context, the where can be anything. It can be a product, a market, a customer or type of customer, a technology, a channel of distribution, a department or division, a country, a type of transaction, or an employee, type of employee, or team. The game is to spot the few places where you are making great surpluses and to maximise them, and to identify the places where you are losing and get out. We have been trained to think in terms of cause and effect, of regular relationships, of average levels of return, of perfect competition and of predictable outcomes. This is not the real world. The real world comprises a mass of influences where cause and effect are blurred and where complex feedback loops distort inputs, where equilibrium is fleeting and often illusory, where there are patterns of repeated but irregular performance, where firms never compete head to head and prosper by differentiation, and where a few favoured souls are able to corner the market for high returns. Viewed in this light, large firms are incredibly complex and constantly changing coalitions of forces, some of which are going with the grain of nature and making a fortune, while others are going against the grain and stacking up huge losses. All this is obscured by our inability to disentangle reality and by the calming, averaging and highly distorting effects of accounting systems. The 80-20 principle is rampant but largely unobserved. What we are generally allowed to see in business is the net effect of what happens, which is by no means the whole picture. Beneath the surface there are warring positive and negative inputs that combine to produce the effect we can observe above the surface. The 80-20 principle is most useful when we can identify all the forces beneath the surface so that we can stop the negative influences and give maximum power to the most productive forces. How companies can use the 80-20 principle to raise profits. Enough of history, philosophy and theory. We now switch gears to the intensely practical.
Any individual business can gain immensely through practical application of the 80-20 principle. It is time to show you how. Chapters 4 to 7 cover the most important ways to raise profits via the 80-20 principle. Chapter 8 closes part 2 with hints on how to embed 80-20 thinking into your business life so that you can gain an unfair advantage over colleagues and competitors alike. We start in the next chapter with the most important use of the 80-20 principle in any firm. To isolate where you are really making the profits and just as important, where you are really losing money. Every business person thinks they know this already, and nearly all are wrong. If they had the right picture, their whole business would be transformed. Chapter 4 Why your strategy is wrong Unless you have used the 80-20 principle to redirect your strategy, you can be pretty sure that the strategy is badly flawed. Almost certainly you don't have an accurate picture of where you make and lose the most money. It is almost inevitable that you are doing too many things for too many people. Business strategy should not be a grand and sweeping overview. It should be more like an underview, a peek beneath the covers to look in great detail at what is going on. To arrive at a useful business strategy, you need to look carefully at the different chunks of your business, particularly at their profitability and cash generation. Unless your firm is very small and simple, it is almost certainly true that you make at least 80% of your profits and cash in 20% of your activity and in 20% of your revenues. And the trick is to work out which 20%. Where are you making the most money? Identify which parts of the business are making very high returns, which are just about washing their faces, and which are disasters. To do this, we will conduct an 80-20 analysis of profits by different categories of business. By product or product group type. By customer or customer group type by any other split that appears to be relevant for your business for which you have data, for example by geographical area or distribution channel, by competitive segment. Start with products. Your business will almost certainly have information by product or product group. For each, look at the sales over the last period, month, quarter or year, decide which is most reliable, and work out the profitability after allocating all costs. How easy or difficult this will be depends on the state of your management information. What you need may all be readily available, but if not, you'll have to build it up yourself. You are bound to have sales by product or product line, and almost certainly the gross margin, sales less cost of sales, you will also know the total costs for the whole business, or the overhead costs. What you then have to do is allocate all the overhead costs to each product group on some reasonable basis. The crudest way is to allocate costs on a percentage of turnover. A moment's thought, however, should convince you that this will not be very accurate. Some products take a great deal of salespeople's time relative to their value, for example, and others take very little. Some are heavily advertised and others not at all. Some require a lot of fussing around in manufacturing, whereas others are straightforward. Take each category of overhead cost and allocate it to each product group. Do this for all the costs, then look at the results. Typically, some products, representing a minority of turnover, are very profitable. Most products are modestly or marginally profitable, and some are making really large losses once you allocate all the costs. I recently conducted a study of an electronic instrumentation group which had eight groups of products that I labelled from A to H. Comparing the sales, income and return on sales for each group with the company total, 
I could see that product group A accounted for only 3% of sales, but for 10% of profits. Product groups A, B and C accounted for 20% of sales, but for 53% of profits. When I compiled an 80-20 table and an 80-20 chart, this was very clear. We have not yet found the 20% of sales that account for 80% of profits, but we are on our way. If not 80-20, then 67-30. 30% of product sales account for almost 60% of profits. Already you may be thinking about what can be done to raise the sales of product groups A, B and C. For example, you might want to reallocate all sales effort from the other 80% of business, telling salespeople to concentrate on doubling the sales of products A, B and C and not to worry about the rest. If they succeeded in doing this, sales would only go up by 20%, but profits would rise more than 50%. You might also already be thinking about cutting costs or raising prices in product groups D, E and F, or about radical retrenchment or total exit from product groups G and H. What about customer profitability? After products, go on to look at customers. Repeat the analysis, but look at total purchases by each customer or customer group. Some customers pay high prices, but have a high cost to serve. These are often smaller customers. The very big customers may be easy to deal with and take large volumes of the same product, but screw you down on price. Sometimes these differences balance out, but often they do not. For the electronic instrumentation group I studied, I broke the customers into four groups and labelled them types A to D. Type A customers are small, direct accounts paying very high prices and giving very fat gross margins. They are quite expensive to service, but the margins more than compensate for this. Type B customers are distributors who tend to place large orders and have very low costs to serve, yet for one reason or another find it acceptable to pay fairly high prices mainly because the electronic components bought are a tiny fraction of their total product costs. Type C customers are export accounts paying high prices. The snag with them, however, is that they are very expensive to service. Type D customers are large manufacturers who bargain very hard on price and also demand a great deal of technical support and many specials. An 80-20 chart and table that compared each group's sales, income and return on sales with the company's total revealed a 59-15 rule and an 88-25 rule. The most profitable customer category accounted for 15% of revenues but 59% of profits and the most profitable 25% of customers yielded 88% of profits. This was partly because the most profitable customers tended to take the most profitable products, but also because they paid more in relation to their cost to service. The analysis led to a successful campaign to find more A and B customers, the small direct customers and the distributors. Even taking account of the cost of the campaign, the result was very profitable. Prices for C customers the export accounts, were selectively raised and ways found to lower the cost of servicing some of them, particularly by greater use of telephone rather than face-to-face -face selling. The D customers, large manufacturers, were dealt with individually. Nine of these accounted for 97% of D sales. In some cases, technical development services were charged for separately. In others, prices were raised and three accounts were tactically lost to the company's most hated competitor after a bidding war. The managers really wanted the competitor to enjoy these losses. 80-20 analysis applied to a consultancy firm. After products and customers, take any other split of business that appears especially relevant to your business. 
There was no special analysis in the case of the instrumentation company, but, for example, for a strategy consultant client of mine, a simple split of projects into large and small categories was very helpful. The figures showed a 56-21 rule. Large projects constituted only 21% of turnover, but gave 56% of profits. Another analysis split the business into old clients, more than three years old, new clients, less than six months old, and those in between. The figures showed that 26% of the business, old clients, made up 84% of the profits, an 84-26 rule. The message here was to strive above all to keep and expand long-serving clients who were the least price sensitive and who could be served most cheaply. New clients who do not turn into long-serving clients were recognised as being loss makers, leading to a much more selective approach to pitching for business. Pitches were only made where it was believed the company concerned would turn into a long-term client. This is the end of CD2. The book continues on CD3.